Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for being here today. We are in the Museum of Natural History, and it is uh, quite logical to make you hear some excerpts of Roger Caillois, who bequeathed this collection of minerals to this beautiful museum. We will listen to an excerpt uh, uh, read by Baptiste Perret, a student actor from the MC93 Acting School. This will be an insight into this beautiful collection. This is an excerpt from a dedication published in 1966. You have the floor, Baptiste. Dédicace. Je parle de pierres qui ont toujours couché dehors ou qui dorment dans leur gîte et la nuit des filons. Elles n'intéressent ni l'archéologue, ni l'artiste, ni le diamantaire. Personne n'en fit des palais, des statues, des bijoux ou des digues, des remparts, des tombeaux. Elles ne sont ni utiles, ni renommées. Leurs facettes ne brillent sur aucun anneau, sur aucun diadème. Elles ne publient pas, gravées en caractères ineffaçables, des listes de victoires, des lois d'empire. Ni bornes, ni stèles, pourtant exposées aux intempéries, mais sans honneur ni révérence, elle n'atteste qu'elle. L'architecture, la sculpture, la glyptique, la mosaïque, la joaillerie n'en ont rien fait. Elles sont du début de la planète, parfois venues d'une autre étoile. Elles portent alors sur elles la torsion de l'espace comme le stigmate de leur terrible chute. Elles sont d'avant l'homme. Et l'homme, quand il est venu, ne les a pas marquées de l'empreinte de son art ou de son industrie. Il ne les a pas manufacturées, les destinant à quel usage trivial, luxueux ou historique. Elles ne perpétuent que leur propre mémoire. Elles ne sont taillées à l'effigie de personne, ni homme, ni fable. Elles n'ont connu d'outils que ceux qui servaient à les révéler. Le marteau à cliver pour manifester leur géométrie latente, la meule à polir pour montrer leurs grains ou pour réveiller leurs couleurs éteintes. Elles sont demeurées ce qu'elles étaient, parfois plus fraîches et plus lisibles, mais toujours dans leur vérité elle-même et rien d'autre. Je parle des pierres que rien n'altéra jamais que la violence des sévices tectoniques et la lente usure qui commença avec le temps, avec elle. Je parle des gemmes avant la taille, des pépites avant la fonte, du gel profond des cristaux avant l'intervention du lapidaire. Je parle des pierres, Algèbre, vertige et ordre, des pierres, hymnes et quinconces, des pierres, d'arts et corolles, aurées du songe, fermes et images. De telles pierres, pans de chevelure opaque et raide comme mèche de noyer, mais qui ne ruissellent sur aucune tempe, là où dans un canal bleu devient plus visible et plus vulnérable une sève. De telles pierres, papier défroissé, incombustible et saupoudré d'étincelles incertaines, ou vase le plus étanche, ou danse et prend encore son niveau derrière les seules parois absolues, un liquide devant l'eau, et qu'il fallut pour préserver un cumul de miracles. Je parle des pierres plus âgées que la vie et qui demeurent après elles sur les planètes refroidies quand elle eut la fortune d'y éclore. Je parle des pierres qui n'ont même pas à attendre la mort 
et qui n'ont rien à faire que laisser glisser sur leur surface le sable, la verse ou le ressac, la tempête, le temps. L'homme leur envie la durée, la dureté, l'intransigeance et l'éclat d'être lisse et impénétrable, et entière, même brisée. Elles sont le feu et l'eau dans la même transparence immortelle, visitées parfois de l'iris et parfois d'une buée. Elles lui apportent, qui tiennent dans sa paume, la pureté, le froid et la distance des astres, plusieurs sérénités. Comme qui, parlons des fleurs, laisserait de côté aussi bien la botanique que l'art des jardins et celui des bouquets, et il lui resterait encore beaucoup à dire. Ainsi, à mon tour, négligeant la minéralogie, écartant les arts qui des pierres font usage, je parle des pierres nues, fascination et gloire, où se dissimule et en même temps se livre un mystère plus lent, plus vaste et plus grave que le destin d'une espèce passagère. Janvier 1966. Merci, merci Thank Baptiste, you, for, Baptiste for this magnificent reading. It's a wonderful book. I have it by my uh, bedside, and um, unfortunately, I cannot open it right now. But uh, I really love this uh, book. I will welcome now Sophie Mouquin, uh, art historian, who has written a book on Versailles and its marbles, and she will talk to us about the marbles from the Grand Décor. And this her uh, book. Uh, received a very prestigious award. Thank you very much. Good morning. It is difficult to speak after Roger Caillois. The marbles of Grand Décor, so marble for uh, uh, a very long time has been a very noble stone and it has been used, uh, 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 it has it, It has been of great interest for amateurs and for scientists. If you look at the typology of marbles and the history of their extraction uh, in antiquity, uh, uh, there it is very well documented. Uh, but uh, in terms of research, uh, you have to wait a later stage, the 17th century and 18th century, and in particular in France. So until recently, we didn't know much about uh, the different essences of marble that were used. And uh, on the incredible journey of this material between the quarry and its final use in the grand décor, meaning large palaces such as Versailles around Paris. We didn't know anything about the identity of the men who were behind the, the use of this uh, material and their names had been forgotten. So I want this morning to tell you about this uh, wonderful journey. I will divide my presentation in three times, in three uh, parts, uh, the uh, material, the men and their works. So this journey starts with the material, the marble. The evocation of this name uh, uh, reminds us of an, the nobility, about the, uh, the, of the brilliance of this stone and also statues and Italy, especially Carrara and this very renowned quarry of uh, the Cervaioli where Michelangelo, uh, Bernini and Rodin would get their marble and their stone. So marble was very much used in the Grand Décor. There is a wide diversity of essences of marble. There are thousands of them. And it is also the case for color and the veins of marble, which are very diverse. So marbles are uh, more than just the white of Carrara that we know. If you look at a definition of marble and uh, old dictionaries, marble is a hard stone which is polished and which, it, which is difficult and long to cut and to work. 
So for geologists, uh, uh, it is a very uh, un, uh, precise definition. In this definition, we do understand that there are ornamental stones and also marbles, uh, which are uh, very different from a geological point of view. In art history, in the history of taste, uh, you don't have the same precision as in the story of science and techniques. Among marbles, you have, uh, you have hard stones, and amateurs will uh, think of alabaster, porphyry, agate, cornelins, uh, and other fine stones, not precious ones, and uh, not only limestones, uh, or metamorphical, metamorphical stones, uh, which are the ones geological focus on. In France, in the 1970s, sorry, in the 17th century, m marbles became a, a very important material for, in terms, from a political point of view, in particular. Why did, was marble used? Uh, obviously, there is a reference to Roman times, to antiquity. It was one of the most uh, used uh, material by emperors. The choice of marble is also related to light that is uh, associated to it. The veins that you see on marbles and its color which uh, carries a very powerful interpretation. If you look at the important sums of money which was spent to uh, quarry marble, to transport it, and to carve it, you have to admit that the use of marble in the Grand Decor palaces under the rule of Louis, Louis XIV couldn't only be uh, the whim, the result of the whim of a sovereign, uh, uh, such as uh, was the case with wood uh, uh, later on. The, the important sums of money which were spent for marble were uh, considered as excessive, but and this was denounced ever since antiquity, especially uh, Pliny, um, who uh, in his natural history book said that uh, we uh, take away what had been placed as a border to separate peoples. Ships are being built to fetch marble and on the waves the wildest natural element. Here and there, the mountain chops are being transported. This very text could have been written for the use of marble in uh, Grand Decor palaces uh, in Versailles or other palaces uh, um, and used by other sovereigns. Well, marble is fascinating. Its uh, uh, color, its uh, shine is so diverse, so rich, that it was one of the most preferred uh, materials of the rule of Louis XIV. But at the beginning of this rule, France uh, hardly had any uh, marble tradition. And uh, uh, it's not in Italy that we uh, went to find the men who knew this material and knew how to use it, but in the southern part of the Netherlands, who had been using marble for a very long time, just as, in, as much as in Italy. And here on the slide, you can see a sample of uh, these uh, uh, beautiful uh, marbles that were used in the Palais Charles de Lorraine, which shows you the diversity of the marbles quarried from the Netherlands, the southern part of the Netherlands. So Louis XIV uh, sourced his uh, marble from uh, Europe at large to find the most beautiful marbles uh, to such an extent that an administration was set up uh, for uh, looking after uh, this marble sourcing. It was called the Service of Marble, Department of Marble. The marbles uh, which you can find in Versailles do not only come from Italy. Here you see a sample of those Italian marbles used in Versailles. I will come back 
to that later on. So the marbles from Versailles, as you can see on this uh, chart, come from um, Europe, from Italy, but also from France, from the southern part of the Netherlands, and uh, also from Spain to a lesser extent. If all of these countries were solicited uh, to supply this beautiful marble, it is because there was a policy of excellence. This policy of excellence goes hand in hand with a quest for quarries in France uh, which could supply marbles which were as beautiful as those which existed in neighboring countries. In France, there was an important search uh, uh, conducted by men who were dedicated to that very task to find the most beautiful marbles for the king. So this history of marble is fascinating. It is also very complex because it is uh, economic. Marble as a cost and uh, it is the extraction and the transportation of marble. You may find a, m a beautiful marble on the top of a mountain, but then you have to be able to uh, carry it uh, all the way to Versailles. It is also a political history because Louis XIV wanted to uphold uh, the national resources in terms of marble, but of, of course excellence was also important. And uh, the quest for marble is also a technical one because some uh, quarries are impossible to uh, use, uh, like the saint Bea uh, quarry that you see on the slide here. And you see the capitals of the Grand Trianon using this uh, marble from Saint-Béa. Uh, it is uh, um, a quarry uh, perched on top of a mountain, so it is very hard to transport the marble. You had to literally throw the marbles from the peak and then to carry them uh, to the bottom of the mountains. So they weren't used uh, as much as was uh, expected uh, for Versailles. So this policy of excellence uh, uh, will be conducted throughout the rule of Versailles and when possible, uh, Louis XIV will use uh, these marbles. The Pyrenees, for, for example, have a lot of marble in Saron Colin. You can see the image on the left here. So very beautiful marble from Sarancolin with uh, uh, different uh, essences and also Campan, a huge quarry with several essences of marble, different colors, green, 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 Grand Mélange, red, okay, Isabel uh, color. So a very diverse quarry indeed. After the Pyrenees, there is also the Languedoc, Oh, uh, still in the south of France, which has a lot of marble that is much more accessible. Also, the very famous, the Grand Incarnat de Cône. You see the quarry and its use uh, uh, in the Triano on the left. And still in the Languedoc, uh, very close uh, from the Grand Incarnat quarry, you see the Griot. Uh, the uh, red cherry uh, marble, the partridge eye griotte, which was uh, used in the quarry of the Bussou du Roi, uh, a few steps away from the Grand Incarnat quarry. Still in France, uh, uh, marble discovered under uh, Louis the Fourteenth, and also part of uh, Louis the Fifteenth uh, uh, rule. Um, so it is the marble of Provence, uh, you, where you can find the Aleppo uh, breccia, which does not come from Syria, but is used in the Tolone, uh, just uh, near Aix-en-Provence. For many essences, there were discoveries in France which did not uh, um, produce the excellency which was researched, so their use wasn't uh, uh, continued for the Grand Decor. There's also the Porter, uh, an Italian marble, which comes from the island of Palmaria, uh, next to Spezia in Italy, a very beautiful marble with a dark uh, um, color with golden veins. We found an equivalent marble. We were hoping to find one, at least in France, in the quarry of uh, Saint-Maxime, or close to Saint-Maxime. 
Unfortunately, this quarry is uh, privately owned. You can see its state today. Uh, it is kept in very good condition still today. But this quarry didn't provide the quality which was expected. So in France, uh, in Saint Maxima, or close to Saint Maxima, you have this uh, uh, dark marble uh, uh, with golden veins, but uh, not with the same um, shimmer than the Italian equivalent. So we use this marble coming from France for secondary elements. You see an example here from the banister of the staircase of the queen, the queen's staircase, which unfortunately fell uh, during an important event. <coughs> so the marble from Barbanson wasn't available, so we use this uh, piece of marble from Saint Maximin, Porteur de Saint Maximin, which doesn't have the uh, quality of the Porteur marble. Another marble, here we're going to another region to show you this uh, competition of marble and the choice of excellency. So the marble of Barbanson now. This marble is used for the columns you can see on the left uh, for the Val de Grèce uh, Baldaquin. It is very beautiful. You should go see it. And this marble of Barbanson, you can see the sample on uh, the right. This marble was uh, compared by its contemporaries uh, uh, to uh, marbles from antiquity samples you can see on the right. These are French marbles, which are very well known. Grand <coughs> Antique mar marble, which is very fashionable today. The quarry was reopened. It is an extraordinary marble. So the marble of Barbanson, if you look at the descriptions, uh, that the Val de Caen from the Val de Grasse was in the Grand Antique marble, which is completely uh, untrue. <laughs> it's not the same marble at all, even though it has the same color. So you can see this discourse uh, which was created to say that uh, more noble marbles were used than they were in reality. And a similar story with the marble of Reims, which is very important in Versailles. Reims is close to Beaumont in Belgium uh, today, uh, close to the county of Hainaut. And this is the marble which has been the most used in the Palace of Versailles for columns and pilasters. It is, in fact, the only marble used uh, for these pilasters, the uh, Hercule, Herculeum uh, uh, drawing room, for instance. This marble was described in the 17th century, 18th century as being a jasp, which is not true. It is a, an authentic marble. The geologists will be happy about that. But uh, with uh, this uh, discourse, you change the origin of the marbles when you consider it is not noble enough. So uh, in this panorama, you can see all the different marbles which were used for Grand Décor uh, um, in the Palace of Versailles. They come mostly for, from European countries and are of excellent quality. This choice of uh, uh, excellence means that sometimes you have to not use some uh, marbles because they are hard to source. The extraction of marble is very uh, is a very delicate operation, and sometimes it is even impossible. In some quarries, as the quarry of uh, uh, Kuhn, you see a picture of uh, this here on the slide. Sometimes the, you have big quarries which are not located in the hill. Uh, on the, in the mountain, but uh, close to a small hill, so transportation is easy. But with the quarry of Saint-Béa, it is impossible to uh, source marble because it is too high. Another marble where you find Sarancola marble, the marble that is used for the chimney of the Salon d'Hercule on the right. This quarry is at, uh, on the edge of a precipice, and it is therefore difficult to use. It was used uh, nonetheless because the king uh, loved that particular marble and wanted uh, uh, 
to uh, use it, but this meant it was more expensive. In the quarry of Campan, to extract the marble, scaffoldings had to be built, galleries, mix systems, which were very complicated indeed. Once the marble extracted, you have to transport it. And this operation is a, a no bed of roses. And there is a fascinating story which I cannot dwell on, but when you look at this marble the, in the Grand Decor uh, spaces, uh, their transportation uh, is a real miracle, especially under the rule of Louis XIV, when the kingdom was always at war, and sometimes you had to cross enemy lines with extremely important loads to uh, uh, carry this marble all the way to Versailles. It is the case uh, of the bath tub you can see here in the uh, bathhouse uh, uh, of uh, Louis XIV. Uh, this bath uh, house is it is a very large uh, uh, block uh, comes from a very large block of marble which crossed enemy lines we were at war at the time that it was a war with Holland so a passport was provided by the king for the enemy to start to stop uh, 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 fire in order for this uh, uh, marble to be uh, carried all the way to Versailles. So this happened very regularly to uh, carry, to transport uh, marble. Sometimes uh, it, it was really a miracle to, to do that. Uh, here you see a specific pathway which was created to transport marble, but these are very narrow passageways on which you had um, carriages with very uh, heavy loads and there were many accidents. Sometimes you can build specific paths, open entire forests, as was the case in the Pyrenees, where a very complex pathway was built between the quarry of Campo and the quarry of Sarancolin to reach the first stream of uh, water. So, uh, uh, this uh, beautiful um, work at the Canal du Midi uh, made the transportation of marble easier. But uh, even after this uh, wonderful journey, when it reached the harbor of Bordeaux, uh, the marble had to be shipped on the sea, and then it was very complicated. Many captains didn't want to carry those blocks of stone, which were too heavy. Some blocks stayed 25 year years in the harbor of Toulon, waiting for uh, 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 ship captains to uh, uh, be willing to carry them and obviously at sea there were many dangers, pirates, uh, storms, the enemies of France. So close to Bordeaux there is a lot of marble sitting around or, or, or lying at the bottom of the sea. And then they had to build uh, special equipment and after they arrived in Paris marbles were offloaded uh, opposite the Louvre, that was where the main harbour was and then they were stored in different uh, storages, the Louis Le Grand storage or the Tuileries storage. All these marbles are then or were then implemented by a generation of uh, marble cutters. And these marble cutters under Louis XIV were not Italian, unlike what many people think. There was a first generation that came from the north of Europe, uh, currently Belgium. As you can see on this map, you can see where they came from and you can see where the quarries were because most of the time they also uh, facilitated the sourcing of marble. So that's where you have the generations of Le Grus, etc. And this first generation trained a second generation of French sto uh, stone cutters uh, with great names, Trois, Leslie, etc. These marble cutters have a huge knowledge of the material. They went to quarries to decide where to, to, to mine, etc. But they're also huge real estate uh, um, moguls and they have uh, huge power. 
you can see here the dots corresponding to the houses owned by these guys. A marble cutter like Trois owned 25 uh, homes, houses in Paris that he was renting. So these are businessmen, really. And for some of them, they even had the beautiful collections of art. The Derbe family, for instance, owned the most beautiful a collection of Boucher paintings. I'm just showing two, but they had uh, far more than that. And his home was um, considered as a showroom for Boucher. And to the right, you have the uh, soap bubbles, uh, which is uh, which can be seen in New York, and that belonged to Trois, another famous marble cutter. As for the works themselves, because this, mar this marble is used to create w wonderful works, it's under Louis XIV that marble became this uh, material for grand décor. So I'm not going to mention all the works in Versailles, but uh, under Louis XIV, all grand décor, both in the palace and in the park, included marble, all of them, without any exception. Marble is implemented in different ways. First, in, wood, in wall panels, here are some examples. So you have uh, high panels that uh, cover the entirety of the, wall, of the wall, as you can see here in the Venus uh, room. And to the top, of the slide, you have the Diane uh, room. These two rooms are next to one another. They open to the ambassador's staircase, which has disappeared, unfortunately, but which was entirely covered with uh, marble, Rance marble, obviously. And these two rooms are very interesting because it shows that the walls can be treated in, the, in different ways. In the Venus room, it's totally flush, whereas in the Diane room, they have moldings and effects in depth that you don't see in the other room. And that's, uh, 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 that's voluntary. All this requires um, total mastery of the material. And they were completed with um, flooring uh, floor tiles, which were absolutely outstanding. We just have a few examples remaining. One is uh, the uh, flooring at Val de Grasse that was protected from destruction, which you can see on the picture here. And then some elements of the flooring in the Royal Church of Invalids. But at the beginning of Louis XIV, uh, um, King uh, Reign, there were these floorings a bit everywhere, and marble cutters had to check that all the marbles had the same hardness, because if you have different hardnesses, then the whole work becomes more fragile. So I'm not going to go into technical details, but there is a genuine technical know-how that's required here. And unfortunately, these uh, Versailles flooring were almost all destroyed because they were washed with water. That water was seeping through between the, 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 the tiles, and that's why they were, it was decided to remove these and to put the wood flooring in the great apartments in Versailles. So we also know the way these uh, wall panels were affixed on the walls. And in Versailles, unlike what people might believe, Versailles is a very ill-designed castle. It was built very quickly in large stones. And in order to fix marble panels, which were quite thick, because um, we know that the thickness, the required thickness, is between two to three inches. So that's quite a lot, and it's very heavy. So in order to uh, fix all this, they were using metal staples, 
And this is what was confirmed when a few years back they started thinking about restoring the uh, peace room in Versailles and more specifically the wall on the fireplace side uh, next to the Queen's bedroom. And the architect was thinking about uh, removing all marble panels in order to restore them. And as I knew that it was uh, fixed in stone with uh, staples, I recommended against that because it would have made the uh, panels more fragile. So we had a projection to try and see where the metal staples were placed. And you can see here all the blue dots correspond to staples that were used to fix the, the panels on the wall. So when looking at all these decors or decorations, we also have to realize, become aware of all the technical difficulties that the stone cutters were faced with. And of course, what was required was to use as little binder as possible. So, let's take a look at the details. First, the uh, bath apartment, which was one of the first one used implementing marble. It was wonderful, based on the first floor of the sh of the castle. Unfortunately, it was uh, destroyed very early on, and the entire apartment was uh, covered with marble with a progression as you went from one room to the next, from the first to the last one, there were five rooms, the marbles that were chosen were uh, getting clearer and clearer. So here is a virtual uh, sketch that was uh, uh, achieved by a, a, a Parisian company, and they managed to have this virtual rendering of the bath apartment so that you can see what it was like. And, of course, uh, the most important room in this uh, bath apartment was the bath cabinet itself with the bathtub, including the wonderful bathtub I talked about before. So that was a wonderful progression in the implementation of marble. Then marble was used in staircases, and more specifically, two of them. One which was destroyed quite early on because it was finished in 1679 and destroyed in 1752. It was called the Ambassador's Staircase. And another one, well, this Ambassador's Staircase was mythical and copied many, many times more specifically in the Pink Palace in Bonny de Castellan, and it was also copied by Louis II of Bavaria. So it was a beautiful staircase that implemented marble everywhere, including on, sta on, on, on the different steps. Um, on the other side, you have the of the castle, you have the Queen's apartment, um, it's made of stone but covered with marble and it was built immediately after the ambassador's staircase and you see that the treatment is quite interesting. There is a difference here between the staircase that was uh, built in 1682 with uh, uh, beautiful marbles and the loggia that opens on a marble courtyard that was built in 1701 and which is totally flush, uh, with the totally flush marbles. And you can see here with the color selection, which is quite different, dark marbles in the staircase, and great incarnate from Combe in the loggia, so much clearer marble. And you see the molding and uh, that are laid on the wall and these beautiful uh, marbles and a few elements of marble in the flooring. Some remain today, especially this uh, rose that was cut in Carrara marble. Then, of course, marbles were used in the Great Gallery, which is the 
major attraction in Versailles, so the Hall of Mirrors in Versailles with the two uh, rooms, the one for peace, the one for war. And you see the same marbles as before, more specifically the Rance marble, which was used on columns and pilasters. And there again, marble is combined with painted uh, decor and uh, bronze. And marble amounted for one third of the expenses, meaning as much as for mirrors, uh, as much as for Lebrun's paintings. What's very interesting here for this uh, Hall of Mirrors is that well, most people say that it's the Versailles perfection, the epitome of harmony, etc., etc. But if you take a close look, and it's uh, when I discovered this sketch that I realized that, you can see that there are differences. In the center of the gallery, you have four niches, uh, some with compound green marble, in the one to the left, you might think it's a bit darker, but it's because the light is not the same. The three first ones are in green marble, and the last one is in red marble. All marble comes from the same quarry, the compound quarry, but not the same color. All historians have always written that this choice was, due, was demonstrating the supreme smartness of the architect who wanted to place the antique statues of Louis XIV uh, collection, had placed uh, the female statues in front of a green backdrop and the male uh, statue on a red backdrop. Okay, that's very nice. But in fact, it was uh, done like this to hide a mistake they made. So here is a blueprint with letters, and the letters correspond to the allocation of the lot in the gallery per quarries. And Mr. Derbe and Misson, in red, worked and provided compound green uh, marble, and their lot included one of the niche. Mr. de Zegre wanted with uh, red compound. So once the work was finished, they said, OK, that's an issue. What can we do? And they said, OK, let's uh, cheat with these statues. Each marble cutter had a lot. And Derbe and Misson had just one niche on the, on the park side. So they worked on their lot. They went to the king's inventories to pick up their blocks. And they said, OK, I work with uh, at, in the Versailles uh, gallery, I need so many blocks. OK, but when you look at the uh, blocks in the inventory, you can't tell if it's green or red marble. So some of them picked up green and others red marble. And at the end of the day, the work is quite inconsistent. And if you look at the windows, uh, it's the same thing. You have great diversity. Uh, there is a mixture of marbles which is implemented in different ways. So you can't see that immediately, but when you see it, you realize that there is a great variety that makes this gallery absolutely beautiful, which, because otherwise it might be a bit boring. If it was implementing the same colors of marbles uh, and always in the same way. So that's part of the uh, richness of Versailles. And once again, it's a beautiful decor, but which is uh, ex executed uh, very fast with some level of imprecision. Likewise, if we look at the details in the columns, well, they do with what they had. And they didn't have the uh, number of pilasters and columns they, ha they needed with the right dimensions. 
Well, they used what they had, and sometimes they corrected, uh, adding some bits and pieces. And in any case, there was not much light back in the days, and it doesn't matter, and it's the whole impression that prevails. This imperfection is something we can find in every single room, like the Hercule room that was completed in 1724. And you see the same marbles, the Rans marble for the columns, but also the Saran Colin marble, a quarry opened under the reign of Louis XIV that was implemented in on the fireplace, but also for some elements on the wall. And this marble uh, is implemented to, to give the impression of abstract paintings. But if you take a look, a closer look, you can see that on the fireplace, in the angle, you have um, kind of the end of a column that looks as if it was crushed. But that's due to the fact that there was a hole. And uh, they filled it up by placing uh, this kind of small uh, pilaster in the angle. So it's all these imperfections that make the, sh the castle beautiful. And this is not in contradiction with the technical excellence. For instance, the uh, window sills, which were uh, in Saran Colin and Campan Green marble, these are made in two parts. So you can imagine how clever um, marble cutters had to be in order to cut marble in days when they didn't have the tools that we have today. So this uh, quick tour around Versailles shows should not make us forget of a wonderful site, that of the Royal Sh uh, Chapel. We know it for its beautiful floors, but very often we tend to forget that this chapel was seen as an entirely uh, polychromic chapel, all made of marble. So the, the, the chapel, we know it today, is quite uh, classical in style, but and it was built in 1710. In 1684, Louis XIV commissioned a real chapel because there was no real chapel in Versailles. So he commissioned a real chapel. So they planned for a circular building. And this circular building is almost commissioned, and there are requests for blocks that are sent to the quarries. But the quantities are gigantic. They're asking for 88 columns of green marble from the Compon quarry and 10 columns measuring 10 meters in height well, in several parts, obviously, but with the comb marble. So you can imagine what it took. And what happened? Well, they never managed to mine the compound marble out of the quarry. It was too complex. And once they extracted some of them, they never managed to transport the columns to the river. So. They revisited their projects and they decided to be more modest and they said, OK, we'll have a nave, a traditional nave, and we'll limit the number of columns. So they moved from 88 to 28. But still, it was impossible to achieve. Then they had to stop working because there was a war, and then at the end of the day, the work site was cancelled, and what's done in the end is a building entirely made of stone and marble is reserved for the flooring. But this flooring has suffered from the injury of time, 
And you can see here small bits and pieces that were not used originally. We've seen that there are 65 t different types of, of uh, marbles, but some were used during restoration works. However, the flooring still exists. These marbles that were supposed to be used in the chapel were not mined for nothing. They were reused and implemented in other works, and more specifically, works that were placed in the park, like and in the colonnade bush, that includes a large number of red marble columns from Combe that correspond to the second project for the chapel in 1688, in alter alternating with Turkin Carrara uh, marbles. This wonderful colonnade was erected in record time because the raw material was available. And why was it available? Well, because most of it had been extracted uh, to build the what was to be the Versailles Chapel. So here, a lot has been written about these marbles, saying that these columns were perfect illustration of French marbles. Well, no, no, not at all. Yes, there is a comb marble from the, the, the southwest of France, but uh, uh, you also have Carrara marble, and Violet Brescia is a marble that comes from Italy as well. So these are two Italian marbles. And the white marble is from Italy. So it's not a sh showcasing French marbles, as some have written. It's a showcasing European marbles, French and Italian. And the last work site was Great Triano, a wonderful palace in the park that came after the porcelain Triano that was entirely covered with uh, tiles, but this one was built in eight months, so that was record time. Why so fast? Well, because they already had uh, all the material that had been extracted originally for the chapel, and they have what remained of the compound columns, the eight ones that were delivered for the chapel, are here in Great Triano. And this Great Triano that was uh, described as the floor palace, because uh, it's a combination between architecture and nature, uh, but this is a building in which only French material was implemented. So Campon from the Pyrenees, Cone from the Pyrenees, uh, and St. Lou stone for the rest of the building. So it's with this extraordinary work that I want to complete our tour of Versailles. This would have not been possible without the beautiful pictures um, provided by uh, Christophe Foin, the wonderful Versailles photographer to whom I pay tribute today. And this presentation showed you that the use of marble in Versailles was linked to the willingness of the king and also illustrates uh, the uh, know-how of uh, men who implemented the stone. And it shows the extraordinary diversity in colors for this uh, beautiful stone. Thank you for your attention. So we will now watch a film on the work of uh, Hardstone at the Opificio delle Pietre Dure. Sorry for mispronouncing in Italian. This is in Florence, in Italy, and Sophie Mucca has uh, commented uh, this film. The Opificio delle Pietre Dure. This is a, a beautiful name, and there's also the commesso, which means to assemble, to put together. This is how we know the marquetry of hardstone. It all started in Florence in this beautiful city crossed by this magnificent river of the Arno that all lovers of beautiful things uh, know. For
for its architecture, they know the city for its palaces, for its churches, its museums, all of these uh, uh, artworks of sculpture and painting, especially from the Renaissance period, when Florence was uh, controlled by the Medici family, who were major patrons of the arts. This family was particularly interested in uh, creation, uh, creative techniques, especially hot stone marquetry. The Opificio delle Pietre Dure is still in existence today. It, today it is one of the main uh, restoration centers uh, gathering all of the techniques available in Italy. Its history started with, we, with one of the founders of the Medici family, Com the I. We are in the 16th century. And Com the I, uh, his portrait was painted by Domenico Pesti and copied in hard stone. In the 16th century, he was an admirer of gems and stones, and he had the idea of creating this workshop of hard stones. He died in 1574, and his two sons, Francois I and Ferdinand, gave the final impulse by creating in 1588 the uh, gallery of works, which then became the Opificio delle Pietre Dure. And its museum has kept uh, all of the tools and instruments which show the incredible know-how of this workshop, which, ca which could ex execute uh, paintings made of stone. The painting is very delicate. It requires, first of all, and first and foremost, a perfect knowledge of the material. And still today, the workshop manager uh, chooses among thousands of stone samples that were chosen by the Medici family. He will choose the very stone which has the veins and colors that are needed for his composition. The technique is a delicate one. After choosing the samples, the stone samples, the craftsman cuts the stone into very thin slabs. Beforehand, he has determined uh, the sketch. The sketch is then transferred, transferred onto a sheet of paper, which is then cut. He chooses the vein in which he knows that the produced effect is the desired one, playing with stone as a painter would do with his uh, paint brushes and colors. He cuts out the contour of the sketch, which is glued with wax on the thin uh, plate, uh, which is three to four millimeters thick. Then this place, plate is placed in a vise, which then leads to the virtual so phase of cutting the various, the various pieces. He uses a bow. Uh, supple wood, uh, hazelwood or chestnut wood, on which is fixed an unserrated steel blade, which is very uh, thin. The blade uh, is coated with an abrasive powder with, uh, to, to cut the, and water to cut the stone at a regular pace. Once the contour has been obtained, the plate is then polished to make sure it can be perfectly assembled with the other pieces of the composition. This operation is very delicate indeed. Uh, you cannot remove too much material because uh, the precision is to the nearest millimeter. That's the very uh, secret of these virtuoso creations. Uh, if we compare the sketch, the project put in color, with the execution in stone, we can measure to what extent these craftsmen were true poets uh, who could make the stone sing and could execute these wonderful stone paintings uh, uh, that uh, is stone marquetry. Between the first trials of the workshop uh, at the end of the 16th century, such as the portrait of uh, Combe I, uh, who is, which is very interesting, but is not yet at the level of a trompe l'oeil, and the in 
if we compare that to the incredible dexterity of the 18th century, we can measure the incredible uh, progression of that art uh, with uh, François Etienne, the great Duke of Tuscany. The um, stone painting uh, reached its uh, apex. Uh, François and Etienne called on Giuseppe Zocchi, who created in 1753-54 an incredible series on the allegory of arts, such as painting, sculpting, sculpture, music, which are still considered as absolute masterpieces, uh, uh, incredible tromplois. Uh, the opificio of the Delle Pietre Dure will maintain this level of excellence throughout the 19th century with naturalistic works, uh, uh, st still works, uh, compositions with uh, using perspective and which use wisely the properties of each stone, the beauty of a porphyry, the delicacy of a lapis and so on. This incredible know-how would have never been possible without the taste of Combe the First, a man who wanted the creation of this mythical place, the Opificio delle Pietre Dure, the flagship still today of European craftsmanship, which still uh, wonders amateurs. Now let's uh, listen to Anne Varichon. She is an anthropologist, a specialist of color, and she is going to tell us about mineral pigments and the role of mineral pigments in our buildings. Good morning. So today, I am not going to talk about the practices of excellence that you heard about so far, but we'll talk about something more modest, more modest. And I'm going to talk about stone as implemented in vernacular architecture. Vernacular is a word used by anthropologists to talk about everything which is domestic. Vernaculus means a small slave that was born in the home of his owner. So. When we talk about vernacular architecture, we're talking about a building erected by the population for the population using local materials and implementing complex techniques, sometimes very complex indeed, but that do not require a specific tooling to be implemented. And most of all, and this is going to pave the way to something different for the day. This is an architecture that translates the beliefs, uh, traditions, and aesthetics of a community. So we're talking about humble use of stones and minerals, but we'll see that far from being uh, limited to a poor architecture, vernacular architecture is full of rich riches, especially in the field of colors. So here is a quote by Michel Serre, because we are going to move to something much lighter than monumental uh, stones. A lot has been written about non-monumental architecture. More specifically, my last slide will give you some uh, bibliogra uh, bibliography indications that you'll have time to write down. But I'd like to focus on books written by Jean-Philippe and Dominique Lanclos. Uh, in the 70s, as of the 70s, they started working to connect the local architecture and the available 
uh, materials that were available locally and they also connected that to the specificities of a territory like uh, the light, the climate, etc. And they developed a methodology which they called the architecture of color. So they could, this, here you have an analysis of uh, color in the northwest of Scotland. What they did is that they took samples of material locally, fragments of stones, etc. They also made sketches with pencils and based on these first uh, color surveys they developed a standard and compared that to an NCS uh, uh, color system or Pantone system in order to end up with a very precise color standard. Then based on this data the L'Enclos couple came up with the mock-ups that combined the color of the facade, of the roof, of the doors and windows to highlight the color features of an architecture in a given location. Then they came up with uh, color charts, summary color charts, that shows sometimes how architecture can evolve over a period of time. That's in Tokyo. At the top, you have traditional architecture. In the middle, transition uh, architecture. And at the bottom, a modern ar architecture. And you can see that there is a greater number of colors uh, as of the period of transition architecture. But we still have a uh, color pattern that uh, is articulated around greys and delicate tones, which um, remind us of uh, Japanese uh, architecture. All this was evidenced by the L'Enclos uh, couple. And as this presentation was asked to an anthropologist, it's an opportunity for me to show that in vernacular architecture, We'll see that this vernacular architecture is a way to solve and to sort out constraints as can be found in the environment. And the way they, the population manage constraints and opportunities tell us a lot about their culture. I won't say much about uh, local cultures, but uh, that's going to be a way to pave the way to studying cultures. Here is the recreation of a village, one of the oldest in humankind. It's in Anatolia, in the south of Turkey, from the 8th century before our era. That's uh, the very first premises of Neo Neolithic Revolution, with the whole population that stopped living a nomadic life. And I wanted to show you that because, well, that's... Um, very ancient times, but it shows that this was a large uh, village, 13 hectares, with a uh, few thousands of inhabitants, and it's all organized around terraces. There is no street. All houses are attached to one another, and the only way the light can penetrate is through a door, and you can access the terraces from a staircase based in the main room in the house, one room in the house plus one smaller room for food. So no streets in these uh, villages or cities, but the coating of the houses were colored with oxides found in the region or bought, sourced from uh, uh, merchants. And there are drawings also on these coatings that uh, illustrate the uh, knowledge of the world for these populations who lived there uh, back then. So it's a prophylactic decor. As soon as humans are not submitted to survival economy, they have this desire to put color in the place where they live. And even before that, Okay, I'm not going to spend too much time on these old examples, but this is to give you some perspective. These are graffitis that were surveyed in, um, uh, in caves, 
And this is rock art in the south of France, in Périgord. Uh, this is what uh, are called tectif tectiform uh, graffitis. Just to show that homes are very much connected to human psyche. They're in the shape of a roof to symbolize shelter. And just like food, uh, shelter is part of the fundamental element in our psyche. And that very often refers to the feminine aspect of uh, life. And home is seen as a prolongation of the mother's womb. And even if it seems very much disconnected from the world in which we live, uh, our language still conveys these relationships with the word cell, which was used to a name uh, small closed rooms before it was used to name the smallest unit in our bodies. Then there is the word to inhabit that refers to the word habit that is a way to wear codes proper to one's culture. There is also the notion of domus in Latin that refers to a genealogy, to lineage, and to the more social role of houses. And then in our language, we have lots of words that refer to the concept of protection, of family, and heritage. So today, I'll talk about all these questions, talking about color, saying that it comes from material, but it also conveys elements of our culture, especially when it can be chosen. And we will go beyond the uh, colorimetric aspects to talk about color as coming from the way it's used and implemented. So here, through examples of stone palettes, colored minerals, and before we move to coloring minerals, I'll talk ab about the difference between colors and coloring minerals. So these uh, palettes, uh, the, this is a, a picture I could not avoid, that of the three little pigs, because in Western culture, stone is the long-lasting, sustainable material that is used for financial investment, but it's also a protective element in countries where climate can be harsh. But what we need to keep in mind is that what's valid in a certain type of climate is not in another one, and there are many populations who, despite they had stones available, prefer to use bamboo or plants to build the house because it allows for the circulation of air. But in vernacular architecture, you find stones implemented in many uh, countries. And as stone comes from the ground, a stone is something heavy, and it cannot be transported over long distances. And we assess that stones were usually used uh, 10 kilometers away from the quarry they were extracted from for the building of private vernacular homes. And therefore, there is some level of identity between uh, a stone and the ground it comes from. This is a home in Brittany. And you can see the house as a prolongation of the ground with the gray slate and granite, which are strictly identical to what is found in the environment. In the Cévennes, likewise, uh, you see a sandstone used for the uh, slates and for the roof. So a lot of similitudes between the surroundings and the house. It's not as true when there are different materials used for the roofing and for the walls. Like here, the Touré village in the Anjou region, where you have uh, uh, the walls made of soft stone, 
whereas the roof is made of slate. So these are a few examples showing that when you start using blocks of stone for the architecture, you can find the geological palette of minerals available in the surroundings. And this has to be seen in terms of color, but as also uh, according to the surface effects of the support. This stone will give a very soft rendering, whereas slate is much smoother uh, and will shine more than other stones. So that's about color. And all these color effects are part of the palette of one specific location. So vernacular architecture is an architecture that used local constraints to develop a, a, an aesthetics. So let's talk about this uh, plasticity. And this plasticity is conversely proportional to granulometry. The lighter the mineral material, the more plastic it can be. And in the case of stone blocks, we see it's quite narrow. But when you move to much smaller blocks, you can end up with much more varied uh, effects. That's the case here in Lower Saxony with wood uh, beams, which are then filled with uh, small bricks and white stone. So that's something which which is quite rudimentary with motives that repeat themselves, but with a regularity that gives a, a monumental uh, rendering. So vernacular architecture is not necessarily a monotonous architecture. It can be quite refined and use um, very local materials. Likewise, for the flooring with these calades that can be found in the south of France, this is in the, in the former house that became a museum. These pebbles were sampled from uh, nearby rivers. They were selected for their color. And just uh, playing with colors, they managed to build impressive <coughs> decors despite a, a rather rudimentary technique. So I said that stone is a material which is heavy, costly, and when stone is difficult to access, it's mostly used for support structures like the slab, the basement, and then they use smaller stones, and then they put some kind of a binder between the stone and this binder can be made uh, with different types of material. To the left, you have an example in set in the south of France with uh, shelled uh, limestone. It can be uh, chips of stone or vine stones, meaning that uh, farmers went to take care of their vines, but they never came empty-handed, they came back with a, a basket in which they would uh, collect the stones they would remove from the field and that they would then use for future constructions. Likewise, likewise in Buget, you see here small blocks of stones, a lot of bricks and cement, all the way to very small stones, uh, as shown in the picture to the right, and you can see a lot of filler that's uh, compacted uh, limestone. And when they use this type of binder, they had to protect it with some kind of coating, and this is where we start uh, talking about the uh, mineral coatings. So a difference between colored and coloring materials. <laughs> colored materials are a gift from nature. These are materials which are present in the earth and are naturally colored. They can be gray, yellow, and most of the time 
the color palette is limited. Well, I shouldn't say limited, but it, it's focused on red, yellow, ochre, because iron oxides are predominant in the crust of the earth. You also have lime, which is a calcium oxide, which is uh, cooked with a shell. So that's the cooking of uh, shells with stone that uh, then it's mixed with water. And this is a material that has uh, been used in vernacular architecture for many, many years. And it's still being used today, by the way. Uh, all this in uh, uh, everywhere in the world from Scandinavia to the south of Europe. The lime has been used everywhere. It's very easy to implement. It prevents the proliferation of insects. It is naturally clear in color. So it conveys this notion of cleanliness and hygiene, which can be important for houses, and it can be easily colored with diff the addition of different coloring materials. These coloring materials, they have a high concentration of oxide. We find them in uh, ochre sands. And these uh, clays colored with those oxides are sufficiently present for them to be worth, for, for it to be worthy to separate the sand from the ochre. You will get a pigment which cannot be, uh, which is not soluble, but which can color its environment, uh, the environment where it is introduced. So the palette is quite similar to the uh, colored materials. You have yellow with iron oxides for those yellows, reds, browns uh, that we call earths, uh, not ochres, and a green coming from Italy, the Brentonico green. It's, so it's quite limited for those colored earths. So colored earths were used uh, everywhere, even when wood and stone were accessible, because by using the local material, a material that has a lot of earth, the architecture is often very much adapted to climate, uh, the climate needs uh, of the uh, environment. Uh, it provides a lot of thermal insulation. For example, in very hot weathers, uh, it is very important to use earth and to insulate, provide some thermal insulation from heat. Uh, so here on this picture, you see that the a skin of the earth uh, is an extension, uh, um, is extended onto those dwellings. If there is enough clay, you can use it as a coating. Otherwise, you add uh, clay to have a paste which can be worked uh, on. It feels that it's very much uh, uh, um, monochromous, but when you look at the textures, it's quite discreet, but uh, it uh, gives a, um, a more diversified color palette. You can have more or less uh, minerals. Uh, there's all, there is also the work of the hand in applying the, the coating. You can use the palm of your hand or you can scratch with your uh, fingers or with specific tools, wooden tools, metal tools, and you create shades which also uh, participate in the uh, chromatic palette of the of the place. In Asia now, in the forest of the Terai, uh, uh, bordering Nepal and India, where different uh, tribes live, the Ranataru in particular where the architecture is made from plants with a coating which is uh, applied on those plants with gray clay, which is quite monochromous, as you can see. But since clay um, espouses the frame of the uh, building, you see those reliefs on the left picture, which create, thanks to the changing light of the place, uh, a sort of shade which will come up in other shades of gray, a very dark uh, black, for instance, and which uh, brings vibration to this monochromous uh, uh, buildings. Uh, it is also the case of the bar reliefs uh, uh, that you can see on the right, 
uh, on the coating itself uh, with prophylactic figures, especially uh, um, a bird uh, used, uh, sketched here, which brings good luck for this tribe. So this, this is a possibility to protect the dwelling and to create uh, uh, some decoration in very uh, rudimentary ways, uh, such as creating shade shadows. Another important aspect, uh, these uh, coatings, primers, uh, are a way to regenerate uh, these buildings, these houses, once a year, the coating is uh, uh, reapplied. Uh, it's a way to bring together the families, uh, the society. Those coatings are made in for all housings, for by all inhabitants, from one one house, uh, from one end of the village to the other. All of the houses in the Mediterranean region, for instance, uh, they apply lime uh, uh, once a year. And this is very important. The elders uh, teach techniques uh, to the younger ones and also those who come from abroad, from other places, uh, learn the local techniques and teach their own techniques. And this is how uh, technical heritages are passed on in specific areas that are very remote uh, from uh, civilization, so to speak. It is also important because these uh, games, uh, th th this way of reapplying lime will uh, uh, have an impact on uh, the, the air conditioning of the house. Uh, the uh, sunlight is reverberated during the summer and during the warmer period. In the winter, the lime will be removed. You will see a darker coating which is underneath, which will absorb the rays of the sun and contributes will contribute to warming the dwelling. In the spring, you start all over again. So it's a sort of natural air conditioning technique. Uh, which uh, also plays a role of social cohesion, which is very important indeed. Another aspect that we tend to uh, lose sight of is that as you add different layers of coating, you uh, get a very sort of soft, gentle uh, uh, shape and the architecture is rounder, which again uh, uh, um, brings to mind the female body, a female body which is very much present in vernacular architecture. Here it is in the Nuba tribe in Sudan. These are archive images uh, from the 1940s, where you see the inside of a hut on the right and a Nuba woman on the left. In this culture, the coating uh, uh, is applied inside the house, outside the house, and in the coating you have uh, incisions and reliefs, which are the very ones that are placed on the body of the members of the community, and in particular on uh, the female body. So there's a sort of transfer between from the female body to the, the habitat, the, the houses. And in this uh, culture, this is why I chose this particular culture today, the transfer goes uh, to the extent of creating openings in the shape of mandals, which uh, um, implies that to move from one room to another, uh, for instance, from the bedroom to the main room, you have to go through a very narrow hole, as you can see on the right picture, which can be ass assimilated to giving birth. So you have the house through its architecture, its relief, its coating is an opportunity to renew uh, a founding act, which is to give birth, and this can be renewed several times a day. And you have that in vernacular architecture. In this vernacular architecture, uh, uh, you can see very simple things. Here it's the case of a house in Ethiopia, the Amara community. There are farmers and pastors 
and uh, they live in very difficult conditions. Here you have a very rudimentary hut with a nurse primer, but some effort was made uh, to adorn the dwelling, to adorn this uh, primer made of earth covering the wall by adding, uh, by adding uh, ash to uh, get a lighter shade and from this you have a very rudimentary type of painting and you see a few motives, patterns being drawn on the wall, uh, uh, circles and hands which uh, uh, create a link with the cosmogony of the people which will protect uh, the dwelling, the inhabitants of that dwelling. So the materials are very humble and the color is mineral, it can be adapted, it is very accessible so that inhabitants can transfer their universe, then cosmogony onto the walls of their dwellings. Uh, and it is also a reflection of their inner uh, world. Uh, where the motives, uh, patterns you can see on the walls, it is a vocabulary you can find in jewelry, in textile uh, uh, garments, uh, um, and other objects uh, and artifacts. So those prophylactic uh, prophylactic patterns can be seen uh, uh, greatly. So earth uh, is not always uh, easy to to use, but with those uh, uh, different colored uh, minerals, you can add some vi variety, you can mix uh, the earth and add water, uh, it, but you have more freedom with coloring uh, minerals. So these minerals, here you have a map of the, an association called Terres et Couleurs from France, uh, which promotes these colored herbs. Uh, so you have a map of countries exporting at an industrial level occurs. So it was uh, a large, uh, uh, a, a large practice. Uh, this resource can be found across the world. It is abundant. The color is concentrated, so you don't need very much to color a lot of coating. So these limited quantities can be transported much more uh, uh, easily than with uh, colored uh, materials. So these coloring uh, minerals have existed since the Paleolithic, uh, Paleolithic age, so in very ancient times, and already then we could warm yellow ochre to uh, transform it into red ochre, and we also knew how to mix two different ochres, a yellow one and a red one, to uh, get an orange pigment. So again, this is to give you a little perspective, the need of color was so strong, was so important to vehiculate uh, uh, different cultural aspects that you can find it in very different uh, countries, places, and uh, in very different periods of time. Uh, so the use of these minerals, uh, uh, we can find it in France, in the uh, uh, Brou mine here. This was exploited from the end of the 18th century until, until the end of the 1940s in Apt. So the mines were still available, but the synthetic pigments which were developed by the industry will gradually replace these ochres. Uh, they will be replaced with thin, synthetic pigments. Uh, of course, uh, also this, the mineral aspect of ochres, uh, which was important at the time. Uh, it was used in the industry of rubber, for instance, for instance to, for, to have a flexible matter. This is why some wheels, bike wheels, uh, were uh, orange, or uh, and this is because uh, ochre was used for in rubber. When ochre will be replaced by uh, uh, talcum powder or other materials, those mines will be progressively abandoned. Uh, but there was a percentage of ochre in the sands that you can see on the picture. Uh, we could separate, uh, uh, extract the block from the quarry. Uh, water would be added so that sand could be suspended. Then the sand would be filtered. Only the water would be kept with the ochre in suspension, which would then be placed in large basins, decantation basins. And once 
once the water had evaporated, you would cut out an ochre block, block of ochre, which is like soap in terms of texture, in order to uh, um, sell them, sell those blocks. In the region of the Vaucluse, uh, or in Roussillon, more exactly, there is a cooperative encouraging encourage you to visit a cultural co-op, which is called Okra. They are in a former uh, plant, um, uh, Noka uh, fabric, the Usine Mathieu. There's a context of uh, associated to the use of ochre, which is shown in this eco-museum where you see the different uh, uh, savoir-faire associated to ochre, but not only. There is also research on color, uh, and there's also a counter of materials available, but and not only ochres, but also synthetic materials used for artistic practices, but also for building techniques. So in this place, you uh, find out uh, uh, about how uh, color was made. There are archives available, some letters for uh, issuing uh, uh, orders. Um, so this uh, fabric at the time was sending uh, barrels of ochres all over the world. And perhaps in New, in New York, they needed restocking. They would send letters issuing requests for restocking as you can see on this picture, and you would have a sample of ochre uh, to show the color that needed to be uh, uh, resupplied. Uh, obviously, according to where the ochre is sourced, the color varies, as with marble, as we saw earlier. And some workers were specialized in uh, uh, the assembly of different ochres, and they could formulate specific colors, very precise colors, according to the request by mixing red, brown, and yellow. So it is not because it is a natural, ancestral material that there is no rigor in the analysis of color. So these uh, ochres uh, will uh, revolutionize the, the use of minerals with their coloring capacity. They could be shipped very easily in lime mortars. Uh, uh, they will bring a, a wider palette uh, compared to colored minerals. Uh, they are non-toxic, uh, they are UV resistant, they can be mixed with any type of binder. So it was a wonderful material which will give uh, 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 land a lot of color to many cities like Tarascon. Uh, the ochre coatings will be in harmony with the paintings uh, of uh, the door frames. So you have very uh, subtle uh, color palettes. So you, f you can find similar arrangements in Naples, many European cities, and all the way to the Maghreb uh, in Western Africa. Here you have a picture of St. Louis in Senegal and Naples as well. Naples uh, uh, on the left, Senegal on the right. So you find these ochres almost everywhere. These coatings will have colors that are quite peaceful as uh, uh, when they are mixed with lime, because lime uh, lightens the mix of color. But when you mix in lime synthetic pigments, you will get more saturated colors, uh, very uh, lively uh, colors. <coughs> as a reminder, we used colors coming from nature, plants, minerals, and animals uh, until the 18th century, all the way to the 19th century. And then in the 19th century, chemists started to discover uh, the principles uh, 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 around which color was organized. Uh, natural color was starting to enter industrial processes, but it was, uh, it would, it would fluctuate a lot. So a young chemist, uh, he was 18 years old at the time. He was working at the Academy of Chemistry in London. He will try to synthesize kinin, and he will get a purple uh, precipi precipitate. And he will realize that it is a, a coloring uh, uh, um, agent that can be used to dye wool and other types of textiles. He will uh, use this uh, uh, dye based on movein, 
and rust. Uh, this will lead to a succession of patents from European chemists, uh, in particular German ones, and this synthetic color will bring a democratization of color. It is cheaper to produce uh, uh, in uh, the construction, uh, uh, in the field of construction, for instance, in industrial processes, uh, for consumer goods, it is much cheaper. So again, color will be, uh, the use of color will be uh, democratized, but with this synthetic color, all the traditional techniques will uh, progressively disappear. Here you have two colors, the, the blue that uh, you can see in uh, the city of Jodhpur in India on the <coughs> left, it is in Rajasthan, the north of India, and in the city of Isamal in Mexico on the right you see yellow oxides uh, which will lead to much more saturated pellets uh, of color. To conclude, the mineral uh, uh, minerals also fuel the art of the ephemeral. Here you have the columns you can see uh, on these pictures in the south of India. Women used to draw them or draw them in uh, Hindu uh, tribes in particular. Uh, they would do this uh, every day, uh, every morning. They would uh, dust the ground uh, using uh, um, uh, um, urine, uh, uh, cow milk uh, to humidify the um, material, and they would draw these columns, drawings, uh, in honor of the Lakshmi uh, goddess, uh, which represents uh, prosperity and feminine energy. And these are graphic uh, prayers, uh, in a way. And these columns uh, will uh, um, be removed under the um, feet of the inhabitants of the dwelling. Sometimes they are made just with talcum powder, uh, uh, using fingers. They would draw uh, these um, patterns. There are very specific rules. The uh, lines should never be opened. Uh, but these drawings will dis uh, progressively uh, disappear and the, the feet of the, the children, the steps of the children or the visitors coming to these homes. Uh, I started my speech, my presentation with the uh, uh, permanent uh, aspect of stone and minerals and I will end my presentation with a tribute uh, to the art of the ephemeral. So, We'll listen to Baptiste again, and Baptiste is going to read two excerpts from Roger Caillois to take us back to the history of stones. L'image dans la pierre. De tout temps, on a recherché non seulement les pierres précieuses, mais aussi les pierres curieuses, celles qui attirent l'attention par quelque anomalie de leur forme ou par quelque bizarrerie significative de dessin ou de couleur. Presque toujours, il s'agit d'une ressemblance inattendue, improbable et pourtant naturelle qui provoque la fascination. De toute façon, les pierres possèdent on ne sait quoi de grave, de fixe et d'extrême, d'impérissable ou de déjà péri. Elles séduisent par une beauté propre, infaillible, immédiate, qui ne doit de compte à personne. Nécessairement parfaite, elle exclut pourtant l'idée de perfection, justement pour ne pas admettre d'approche, d'erreur ou d'excès. En ce sens, cette beauté spontanée précède et déborde la notion même de beauté. Elle en offre à la fois le gage et le support c'est que les pierres présentent quelque chose d'évidemment accompli, sans toutefois qu'il y entre ni invention, ni talent, ni industrie, rien qui en ferait une œuvre au sens humain du mot, et encore moins une œuvre d'art. L'œuvre vient ensuite, et l'art, avec comme racine lointaine, comme modèle latent, ses suggestions obscures mais irrésistibles. Ce sont avertissements discrets, ambigus, 
qui, à travers filtres et obstacles de toutes sortes, rappelle qu'il faut qu'il existe une beauté générale, antérieure, plus vaste que celle dont l'homme a l'intuition, où il trouve sa joie et qu'il est fier de produire à son tour. Les pierres, non pas elles seules, mais racines, coquilles et ailes, tous chiffres et édifices de la nature, contribuent à donner l'idée des proportions et lois de cette beauté générale qu'il est seulement possible de préjuger. Par rapport à elle, la beauté humaine ne représente sans doute qu'une formule parmi d'autres. De la même manière, les postulats d'Euclide, parmi tant de postulats possibles, ne correspondent qu'à un cas particulier d'une géométrie totale. Écriture des pierres, structure du monde. La vision que l'œil enregistre est toujours pauvre et incertaine. L'imagination l'enrichit et la complète avec les trésors du souvenir, du savoir, avec tout ce que laisse à sa discrétion l'expérience, la culture et l'histoire, sans compter ce que, d'elle-même, au besoin, elle invente ou elle rêve. Aussi n'est-elle jamais à court pour rendre foisonnante et despotique jusqu'à une presque absence. Au moment de quitter ce monde de signes, de feintes, de sollicitations discrètes ou pressantes, une dernière agate, d'un dessin complexe et insolite m'entraîne plus avant sur la pente de la rêverie. La partie translucide de l'échantillon est enfermée dans une écorce opaque qui présente la rugosité et les couleurs beige pâle, noisette et brou de noix du bois silicifié. Au cœur de la plaque, mais légèrement déportée, une fenêtre d'aiguille de quartz dont les pointes virent au violet dessine autour du vide central un losange curviligne, convexe sur trois faces, creusé sur la dernière. Les prismes scintillants sont entourés d'un large ruban de calcédoine assuré que borde de chaque côté un lycéré rouge ou orangé. Le losange en sort quelque peu maltraité. L'un des angles s'est étiré, un autre s'est épandu en une sorte de poche. Sur les quatre côtés de la figure se greffent alors des quadrilatères clos, tracés par des lignes maigres, tour à tour cerises et bleu roi. Ces cantons nouveaux ne coiffent jamais les pointes du losange central. Ils amorcent entre elles une prolifération latérale qui s'achève bientôt. Les traits lumineux qui pendent aux extrémités des trapèzes inférieurs se perdent dans la rumeur chaude et dans l'huile ambrée de la gâte. Ils y semblent des reflets brisés et inexacts qui se répondent l'un l'autre sans qu'il soit possible de savoir lequel est le modèle et lequel l'image. À la fois, ils s'équilibrent et diffèrent à la façon des irrégularités voulues des tapis d'Orient. Ces ramilles s'interrompent d'un coup, cependant que les rubans, les ombres de la pierre qu'elles ont coupées une dernière fois avant de disparaître, continuent de relayer, de multiplier jusqu'à la périphérie ligneuse le profil du losange essentiel. Ils l'amortissent lentement, mais son grand axe continue jusqu'à la fin de commander la symétrie tremblée de la composition entière. La féerie des couleurs. La magnificence de la matière force l'admiration. Elles ne sont pas exceptionnelles dans l'agate. En revanche, la symétrie écartelée d'un système d'angles, de polygones qui esquissent un réseau, y surprend à l'extrême. Elle manifeste l'essai d'une géométrie impuissante à se maintenir et qui éclate à peine commencé. Thank you so much, Baptiste, for these wonderful readings. As an introduction to Gilles Perrodin, a great architect who since the 80s has been working with tone in construction. And today, uh, 
soil as well, but we'll listen to him talk about his project with uh, Stone. Good morning. Well, first, I want to thank the Academy and the Hermes Foundation for inviting me, and I want to thank you, Lena Goodman, and all the members of the Academy uh, working with the Hermes Foundation. So I'm going to try not to talk about technical aspects too much today. There is a book that I wrote a few years back, 10 years ago, to be precise, and uh, this is where you can find all the technical answers to any technical questions you might have about uh, construction in stone. As we practice it and have been practicing it for more than 30 years. So that's the, the book in which you can find answers to any of your questions. This book is being uh, published again at Presse du Réel. Uh, it was no longer available so far, but will be soon. So my experience with Stone started with two singular events. The first one was my discovery of the Torone Abbey. That's the oldest event, because it dates back to the first years when I was studying architecture. It was a revelation. But it took a certain time before I understood the significance of this discovery. And the second event was more recent, and that's when I discovered the bridge over the Gar River and the quarries located nearby. And it's from this discovery that I started working on stones. It was during a holiday, and on the path I walked every day to go to the river that I found a set of huge stones which had been piled up there, by the owner of a car garage, and he wanted to hide his work. I was seduced by this construction, and I wanted to know where the stones came from. I discovered the quarries, and that was a big emotion. In these quarries, I discovered huge stacks of stones, and I was taken in this uh, uh, intoxicating maelstrom, I saw the pyramids, the b palaces of Herod, the Machu Picchu, the Mayas, the cathedrals, and the stones were giving me their secret. They were whispering, take me, we will take you through time. Each grain of us will testify about cosmos and you'll be at peace. Just lay us honestly on the, gr on the ground at the service of those who commission you and will do the rest. These stone sirens uh, charmed me and I st embarked on this journey. So I started working on my first uh, stone construction, the Vauvert uh, vin uh, wine cellar, and this exper experiment changed my, the way I thought about architecture. I wanted this building not to be just a warehouse for wine, but a temple for the glor to glorify wine, to remember Roma the Romans who were crushing the, 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 the grapes with their feet, and to remember the Romans that then had discussions about the beauty of the world. I wanted this uh, uh, work to be centrifuge and centripet to talk about the world because wine is elaborated in a closed and secret place but leads to very friendly discussions. With the simplicity of my quarries, I had worked on a construction module that was 50 centimeters in width and two meters in length. It was just like cubes that allowed me to lay the stone either vertically or horizontally and only in these two directions. There was no offset, no useless fantasy. These were long blind walls delineated by the uh, length of my module and laying them became a game of assembly that was very fast. I started uh, thinking about the quality of stone construction 
and, and among these qualities, the fact that it was very easy and very fast to erect. And I realized that this change in paradigm that had an impact on my approach as an architect, because I was just generating figures of stability and just assembling stones that resist and find their balance just because of the way they were assembled, I no longer had to imagine forces that were imposed onto me. You can't imagine how much a small construction uh, includes hours of study to achieve this formal ideal that uh, turns it into a, an object that has a single meaning. This is the work of a real architect. It's a labor of passion. You look for the proper path to change a, a pile of stone into a divine work because it's in our action that we find the uh, actual presence of the divine, as Paul Valéry said. We have to dive in the matricial mud and then fly to heaven. It's difficult to describe this uh, labor. It's um, moving from material to asceticism, as Marie of Egypt said, to give an understanding of the work of the Creator, moving from extreme sensuality to extreme sanctity. Uh, to say that uh, simplicity and lubricity are not contradicting and we have to mix heaven and hell in one single embrace. A stone without a, ge a, a, ge a location would be a skin without body. But if we can lift our soul in these places, it's thanks to the stone, to its existence, to its concrete presence. Ideologies are sterile, and they can change uh, at all times with nothing else changing. Every night after my, works, after my work, I placed my hands and my forehead against the stone, I was smelling the strange and powerful odor of creatures entrapped in the stone. Each centimeter of stone was telling me about their life, their fate, and I was in the great chaos of atoms liberated by energy. I recognized the stone as it was mine. With I was in material, but I was in the galaxy, in the stars, with... Uh, all its turmoil. The vein of the stone are the life within us. This is when I understood that material was our history. Whether standing or lying down, the stone was delivering its secret and talking to me as if it was myself. Why erecting it? Why offsetting it? I no longer had to shape material. Material shaped itself. Industrial technologies has uh, taken, us, uh, taken us away from living material. We are no longer one with us because in order to work on steel, we have to use fire, we have to work. But material, and this material is not owned. Material dictates its rule. By forging steel, the forger becomes, the blacksmith becomes steel. And it's the same thing for carpenters, masons, stone cutters. It's the material that guides the hand towards where the material wants. Comble Barrieux is a village not far from Toulouse, and that's where I built a hundred uh, lodge uh, houses in stone. These are very sober houses. Why? Because we no longer build houses to live in them, but to sell them. And architects are developing shapes to satisfy demand in a productivist world, a world of novelty. And an object has to be trendy or even avant-garde in order to allow mer mer merchandising and communication to attract customers. And these houses can no longer be inhabited, they are consumed, and humans lose their feeling of belonging in the world. They seek refuge in 
other universes or metaverses which are increasingly illusionary in order to find again this uh, uncomfortable situation. They live their life in coffin houses which are filled with uh, hamburgers. Architects can no longer build houses, they are building lodge, uh, lodgings. Inhabiting is, a, is an action, and to become inhabitable, houses have to escape the action of creators. The rules of stone creation are a constraint, like those imposed by the Ulipo literature group, for whom constraints release creators from their uh, psyche. So that's why creating a house has to be accomplished through the act of inhabiting. Based in Gar, the Orthodox monastery of Solon called me in to build their uh, wine cellar and various nuns came to visit me. I was quite enthusiastic because it's rare a divine, the divine commissions any work from me. So, after many discussions, I had very little, a little number of orders, and my faith was turned into a doubt on this um, way to Damascus. But thanks to my nuns, I managed to go back on the path and spread the good words the good word all the way to heaven. I was uh, expecting old nuns, but I was very much surprised when I saw a team of very young nuns with lots of enthusiasm. They were dressed in large black dresses, and all I could see were their faces, uh, very pale, that were floating over the over the grounds. I had them visit my wine cellar, and I told them about my commitment in favor of uh, of stone and ecological material. They felt the stones under their hands. I very often realized that visitors enjoy touching the stone when they visit my wine cellar. I thought they were doing that to pay tribute to the to the earth we all come from. And I understood that the earth was built in the same process to which, from which we come. We are all born from the same material, i.e. stone. Each stone is a jewel, an eternal richness, and the secrets or in the stone that we caress every day. In a block of marble, there might be a lake with fit, fish, as Leibniz said. Or as Michelangelo said, in each block of stone, there is a statue in, inside, and it's the role of a sculpture to discover it. Life in a monastery, life remote from the world, shows you that light comes from shadow, because if light is given to us, we have to conquer darkness, and the work of an architect is a work from darkness. Modern architects have been blighted by the charm of the industry, and looking for light and transparency is a red herring. It blinds us, because for whoever looks at the sun in the... Uh, looks at the sun, we know that the sun is black. What we try and do is to make material disappear, but material is life. And trying to make to make it disappear means that we're working for death. And my nuns look from the earth to heavens. It's a vertical movement. And stones translate this spiritual dimension, and light is in the depth of the stone. Each time, each day, the sun going through the facade creates vibrations which are more or less intense depending on the seasons, and variations are always identical. So this double movement, vertical and horizontal, sheds light on the commitment of the community. We go from the infinite despair of human conditions to the infinite hope of a divine mercy, and this to embrace the fate of all humans that were born and die every day in life. And the rhythm of facades is, an as to, uh, is opposed to our materialistic world. This house was built in Lyon. This house 
is the house of a uh, gallery owner in Lyon, uh, and it's located in an, in, on an impossible plot of land. We, the volume that we built is the maximum volume we were allowed to build. And the plot of land gave me an opportunity to start thinking about the home from the inside. I didn't want to be guided by any formal consideration. I wanted to approach the uh, degree zero of architecture. Architecture would only result from a sum of constraints that were uh, uh, following one another. It was the very embodiment of the theory of chaos and uh, it was the perfect embodiment of uh, the of of being uh, constrained. Spaces are cut or carved in a block of stone, like in a work by Shinida. The three theses of inhabitable spaces as uh, blocks that are like accidents on the way. You penetrate the blocks of stones and volumes come one after the other as elements in a landscape. And faults in the material allow the light to come through and the light caresses the stone that uh, trembles and reveals its history. Walls are like open books on the fate of the world and some even saw uh, the faces of sacred uh, uh, characters. I like these uh, architecture and these houses because to me they reveal an invention which got rid of expressionist uh, architecture which is highly polluting for our work. The Musée des Vins so we'll talk to you about a wine museum in Corsica. It is a public building which promotes uh, uh, regional wines, uh, patrimonial wines uh, coming from Corsica in particular. It has the ambition to be a meeting place for the cultural culture of wine around the Mediterranean region, built in stones, uh, uh, thick stones of 60 centimeters. Um, this museum of wine draws its in inspiration from vernacular homes in Corsica. If you walk along the Corsican paths, you will meet uh, along your uh, on your journey those uh, dry stone constructions, uh, stone buildings uh, with planted roofs uh, that look like hair. They're called bayaju, bayaju. A sort of uh, uh, shelter for shepherds. Uh, the roof was in Luz, and these constructions can be sound, uh, found all over the Mediterranean region, capital, truly, truly that I saw recently in uh, the south of Italy in Albero Bello and they're also called Davuzo in the island of Pantelleria. We, they also have a, car, a square shape. We find them in the Balagne uh, area in Corsica. The Museum of Wine is formed by small constructions in clusters with uh, basins uh, on the slope. I would like to read a text uh, which is quite uh, essential to me, which I discovered when I was a teenager, a text by Albert Camus. Uh, uh, taken from nuptials, uh, nos a tipaza in French. What I see equals what I believe in tipaza. What I see equals to what I believe, and I am not going to deny what my hand may touch and my lips may caress. Tipaza spoke to me as those characters uh, that we describe uh, who uh, signify a point of view onto the world. Uh, they testif testify in a manly way. It is a character. It is like uh, uh, um, a sort of infinite intoxication. There's a time to live and there's a time to testify to that living. And as you can only live with all of your body and testify with all of your heart. Living in Tipaza is uh, uh, then you will testify, uh, 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 give a testimony on the work of art. 
So using stone has changed my architectural practice. Nothing in me is uh, driven by thought. Uh, it, all, it is all about action. I love before thinking about that love. The stone likes to be caressed. You need to think about the matter. The partner is a great, the great dream, dream of man. The art disappears in the contemplation of inner, inert forms, vernacular construction. I was very happy, by the way, to listen to this presentation on vernacular dwellings. It is a sort of uh, quintessential model for me, vernacular construction, which links man to uh, its his existence. Uh, in vernacular forms, matter guides the architect, uh, whether it is wood, earth, uh, straw. Uh, they are one with uh, humans. They're there is uh, no separation between the dwelling and the man. There is no, the, the form is not thought of. Uh, man is guided by the matter, by the form. Man is not concerned by the beauty, the love for beauty. The, his art is uh, uh, a sparing one. It is a frugal art, and architects were uh, uh, archi an architect is a land surveyor. Imhotep was a land surveyor. Don't forget that. Laying stones, so the action removes the sketches. You can start the journey. It is for the. This is the mystical garden of the. Uh, Sito Abbey, this mystical garden was created for this community. It hasn't yet been built. The original uh, Sito Abbey was destroyed during the revolution. But the community uh, now wanted uh, to offer a place with a, a spiritual uh, dimension, a religious uh, dimension. What is a mystical garden? The monasteries of the Middle Ages had gardens, the Hortus conclusion. Uh, parts of those gardens were kept for the devotion to the Virgin Mary. They were planted with roses, which symbolized the Mother of God, the monastery isolated from the temptations of the world. This is a text by Bernard Beck in his Monastic Gardens, Mystical Gardens, this book. The gardens are surrounded by silence. It's an image by excellence of paradise. Uh, the monks uh, uh, drink at the fountain of the scriptures. They gather nectar, the nectar of the orchards. They absorb the word of uh, God, and the roses exhale the sweetest perfume. The composition is a square divided into seven gardens of a different size. Each garden offers a different experience of scents, of water, of roses, of stone, which combine to pr produce different sensations. Then you cross a thick wall and a humid passage, which leads on to another humid passage. Each garden is a different experience uh, that come one after another, like life that is guided by chance. In those gardens, the roses can be climbing. You can have bush roses. You can have tree roses with different colors. You can have leaping water, gushing water, falling water, flowing water. All of these experiences are driven by natural energy, wind energy, solar energy. You have of, uh, organs of water, uh, uh, singing chimneys, the cut stone is brutal, and then it is caressed, embraced, and uh, hit. You have the sense of the roses, of jasmine, the dance of the butterfly, the reflection of water through light, the murmur of ba ba basins, the wind blowing all of these sensual sensations are a door to, this, to understanding the spiritual world. The stone in the shade, in the darkness, uh, life pulsating in those veins, in the veins of the stone that guides us. They speak of those who came before us. Uh, we can overcome the present to, and it will guide us to the future. It is a bulwark 
This place is also musical, its proportions, its rhythm, the matter, the light is organized like a symphony. The shade overcomes the light, it rounds up the day. The days are not long, they are round, as Juno would say. Therefore, the silence that rustles uh, uh, blends with the tumult of stone, the water organ singing the stone, uh, the seguia, these irrigation channels uh, guide uh, us, uh, and we see the diversity of stone, a diversity which was created by those Cistercian monks. You see the old mill approving. The monks from the Sito Abbey uh, established an enclosure of stone which protected the culture of wine in the face of barbarism. Stone will teach us the wisdom of a garden um, isolated from the rest of the world. I will just show you very briefly, perhaps, two uh, lodgings, a uh, series of lodgings built in Lyon and Geneva. And perhaps we'll take more time for the last project I wanted to show you this morning. So this first project is uh, located close to the uh, banks of the River Rhone. It has different functions. Uh, there's, uh, there are offices above, lodgings, um, three levels of housings, and uh, a level of duplexes. So there are a number of constraints uh, given the rules for building with stones. Uh, uh, you want a pared down stone structures, structure with solid stones, building with solid stones with no reinforcement, no reinforced concrete or steel. You have to draw your inspiration in the history of construction and the rules for building with stones um, mean that uh, we have to abide by a, sort, a certain historical practice. Uh, Bruno Latour uh, didn't want to oppose modernity and archaism. This is one of the virtues of stone to immerse us in an archaism that is contemporary in almost avant-garde. In La Croix Rousse, the buildings of the silk workers depended on a very efficient construction. Um, of high performance, uh, therefore the forms of the constructions were very simple, the matter could express itself freely, there are different stalls with different roles adapted to their characters, uh, harder at the bo bottom, more gentle for the lodgings, each grain of stone is unique and governs uh, the history of the work. The matter of stone and its structural um, twin immerses the place in another history where men can work at peace. And stone, by its only presence, attaches us to the history of the place. With stone, we can build cities with no uh, um, rupture. It produces shade, a shade that overcomes the light. Here are a few images of a project of uh, lodgings in Geneva, where the lime scale, uh, where lime scale was used. It was, uh, in fact, imposed by the urban planning plan. We had two large uh, blocks of limestone that were used. These lodgings are archaic as uh, uh, what. Uh, has been uh, uh, what was uh, is still uh, uh, is the fundamental condition of the ha of the act of inhabiting, and the rigor of the of the writing of stones uh, means that architecture is timeless. The stone is very much linked to history in. Vitruve, in Vignol, uh, Vitruve, sorry, Vignol, Viole Ludic are architects from the past. I will end with one last project which hasn't been yet completed, the Garden of Even, built in the quarry of Fontvieve. This quarry is one uh, is located in the south of France, near Arles. In this uh, quarry of Fontvieve, there is a big hole, like a football stadium, uh, very deep also, 20 meters deep. There are a few buildings which were sketched by Fernand Bouillon. 
At the end of this pit, the owner of the quarry asked us to link those uh, together to show the capacity of stone to be reused uh, in this very pit. We used a stone uh, uh, that uh, were used by Fernand Prion for his uh, uh, projects in Paris and in Algiers. Uh, he created several tens of thousands of buildings, of housings. These constructions uh, from the 1960s were made without double glazing, without air conditioning. But if we look at their uh, uh, carbon footprint or energy consumption over a period of time of 60 years, their carbon footprint uh, is uh, truly amazing compared to contemporary low carbon constructions. What about the inertia of stone when you have a heat wave? Fascinated by the Gothic cathedral and their lace, uh, sh lacy shapes, I wanted an enclosure of uh, stone with a, a symphony of light accompanied by the song of uh, the water coming from the uh, inner fountains. Uh, these uh, thick walls of churches uh, increase the penetration of light as they reflect onto the walls. Uh, so I was imagining unique models of stones, blocks of stones which could be reused so I cut out uh, rectangular shapes following one particular angle. I started the assembly with regular assemblies, with regular openings, but with large blocks which can only be held with uh, the uh, inertia, with the gravity. There is no binder, there is no coating. I could assemble them in a very unique way, which changed my initial approach. This is what we call serendipity. I uh, wanted these assemblies to be coordinated. I didn't change my initial um, goal. And light became a sculpture in my research for this uh, mystical garden project, which I uh, showed you earlier. I discovered that paradise came from a Persian well word which means enclosure. In this enclosure, there is a garden, the garden of uh, Eve, uh, symbolizing the beginning of the wor world. Uh, it is also a tribute to Eve, a young landscaper, in a way, who uh, uh, lost uh, her life uh, uh, quite in unfortunate uh, conditions. So these places uh, have a lot of minerality. Uh, this stone is worked again and again. The stone uh, uh, is full of uh, water. You have cracks. Uh, water and stone form a couple which generate life like blood in our bodies. So these gardens are a sort of metaphor of the, the quarry. You have uh, different separate blocks uh, which form steps. Uh, the, uh, the water flows beneath your feet. Uh, everything has to be reimagined. The stone lies on the new world, which is uh, which is about to be built. Night and day come together to generate uh, uh, the, the wildlife. Uh, life is at work. Uh, the blood is uh, pulsing through the veins of the stone. The water is, is sucked in uh, the plants by the plants. I try to appease the world because stacking stones is a very archaic uh, uh, project. But given the extreme complexity of the world, um, this uh, um, act, uh, the act of building with stone, is very simple. I try to pacify men from their torments. Uh, uh, I want to. Uh, um, offer something more peaceful, something appeased. Uh, this uh, garden aims to do that, uh, to move away from the chaos of our society, especially uh, the increasing role of technology today. Uh, 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 this uh, tries to uh, uh, soften uh, the, the world to offer something that is more uh, peaceful at the risk of being uh, shouted at uh, and rejected by uh, uh, other people. 
and even uh, lapidated with the very stones that I have used to uh, build uh, my uh, stone constructions. But as a consolation, the gods of architecture will be able to recognize their own kind. Thank you for your attention. We will uh, close the session with a last uh, excerpt read by Baptiste. The floor is yours, Baptiste, before my conclusion. Thank you. Le fond de la pierre est bistre pâle. Le profil d'un vaste château s'y découpe en brun luisant. Sous une lumière rasante, le fond devient mat et le sombre édifice miroite d'un éclat presque métallique. Les valeurs changent, les contours demeurent. De profonds chemins de ronde séparent les enceintes successives. Au centre, une tour à plusieurs étages domine l'ensemble des constructions. Il s'agit d'une coupe transversale sans épaisseur ni perspective qui donne seulement l'élévation du bâtiment imaginé. Si haut qu'on le suppose, il est encore dominé, ombragé par de larges feuilles inclinées de fougères arborescentes. Elles déploient leurs dentelles gracieuses bien au-dessus des tours. Le spectateur se demande quelle végétation tropicale a pu développer d'aussi gigantesques ramages qui réduisent un palais à la dimension d'une maison de poupée. L'œil hésite et ne sachant que choisir pour échelle de grandeur, tour à tour magnifie la fougère et amoindrit l'édifice. À droite, dans le ciel, des oiseaux tourbillonnent. À gauche, il n'y en a qu'un, mais immense. Les ailes déployées et le cou tendu vers le bas, ils font sur les terrasses inégales où s'agite un étrange peuple. Car le château est habité. Sur chaque terrasse, au fond de chaque fossé, dans chaque fenêtre ou escaladant les murs, se tiennent des silhouettes parallèles, orientées dans la même direction et figées dans la même attitude. Ces personnages fort distincts, quoique maladroitement tracés, semblables aux bonhommes que dessinent les enfants, sont tous debout, de profil, tournés vers la droite. Comme s'ils étaient aveugles, ils étendent leurs bras loin devant eux, dans le vide ou jusqu'à la paroi prochaine. Eux aussi ne sont qu'ombres chinoises. Leur absence d'épaisseur ajoute à l'irréalité de la scène. Que regardent ces êtres plats Où se dirigent-ils Leur geste est-il de protection ou de vénération Tout à droite, de l'autre côté d'une sorte de pont, la seule silhouette qui soit différente semble les attendre. Elle n'est pas de profil. Une tache blanche lui donne l'ébauche d'un visage. Toute la scène est trois fois traversée par l'étincelle céleste, biffée du zigzag blanc de l'éclair à l'instant où il foudroie un univers dément. Rien ne ressemble davantage à une image. De tous ceux à qui j'ai montré la pierre, il n'en est aucun qui d'abord ne l'ait cru peinte par quelque artiste naïf ou maladroit, enfant ou néophyte de son art. C'est à l'examen seulement qu'on s'aperçoit qu'il s'agit d'une sorte de tableau naturel. Encore certains ont-ils du mal à l'admettre et pensent à quelque supercherie tant il leur semble inconcevable que le hasard seul ait pu produire un dessin qui paraisse à ce point l'œuvre de l'homme. Au vrai pourtant, il n'est rien ou presque de prodigieux dans les éléments qui le composent. Les fougères géantes sont de simples dendrites, encore que d'une forme peu courante, comme il en existe en abondance dans de nombreux minéraux. Les oiseaux se réduisent à des taches cruciformes. Les accidents de la pierre qui figurent les façades ajourées sont moins évocateurs et moins précis que ceux qui, sur les marbres de Florence, tracent des panoramas de villes en ruine. Seuls les bonhommes demeurent étonnants. À la fois semblables et différents, ils sont toujours solidement campés sur leurs deux jambes, la tête haute, les bras explorant l'espace à mi-hauteur du corps ou portant une offrande invisible. 
la forme est nette et ne peut évoquer autre chose qu'une silhouette humaine. Le plus étrange est peut-être qu'elle se répète et que chaque fois les pieds du personnage reposent sur le sol, tandis que le corps se détache parfaitement, vertical au centre des rectangles clairs des fenêtres ou des portes. En cette ressemblance réside une rencontre capable de stupéfier, mais la seule est pointe inexplicable si l'on pense qu'il n'est jamais impossible, qu'il est même presque obligatoire qu'une forme ressemble à une autre. Certes, dans le cas particulier, la forme, la silhouette humaine est privilégiée. Elle n'apparaît pas une, mais dix fois. Persistante qu'il n'est qu'un et dans la même attitude, et mise en valeur, encadrée, D'où le trouble et l'idée persistante qui n'est qu'un dessin pour expliquer pareil dessin. Voici circonscrite l'anomalie autour de quoi s'organise l'affabulation des fougères, du palais, des oiseaux, de la foudre enfin, veine banale comme on en voit sur n'importe quel marbre. Nul miracle ni mystère mais un extraordinaire concours de signes sans signification qui, par le jeu des analogies, aussitôt en reçoivent une, que l'imagination piégée leur refuse difficilement. Thank you very much, Baptiste. We see the human part in stone, and this is the conclusion of this matinal, this morning session. We hope to see you once more for the last uh, uh, session of these matinal, these morning sessions with the Fondation Hermès, uh, which will take place in June. We want to celebrate the end of this cycle uh, during that last session. Thank you very much. <laughs>